The Hebrews created history as we know it. You don't get away with anything. And so you might think you can bend the fabric of reality and that you can treat people instrumentally and that you can bow to the tyrant and violate your conscience without cost. You will pay the piper. It's going to call you out of that slavery into freedom, even if that pulls you into the desert. And we're going to see that there's something else going on here that is far more cosmic and deeper than what you can imagine. The highest ethical spirit to which we're beholden is presented precisely as that spirit that allies itself with the cause of freedom against tyranny. And yes, there, there exactly. Is that hope. I want villains to get punished. But do you want I, the I, villains to learn before they have to pay the ultimate price? That's such a Christian question. <laughs> For a long time, on the self-esteem front, there was this idea that positive affirmations for children were the way to self-esteem. All that false praise, that devaluation of the currency of reward, that overgeneralization of, of uh, insistence upon your child's singular wonderfulness at the expense of other people, it didn't improve self-esteem. What it did was inflate narcissism. And so all this idiot insistence on self-esteem through continual affirmation, you produce this increase in self-centered narcissism and you make kids more isolated and miserable and lonely than they would have otherwise had to be. When I worked with parents, it, it was constantly, you know, a child would come home and say, I, somebody kicked me in the playground. And the first question from the parent was not, so what did you do about it or what happened? But, and how did that make you feel? And, and what it does is it gives power to feelings above actions. And so you, you get a child who, then the child stops and thinks, well, how did I feel about it? And it's usually, you know, sad or angry or happy. You know, it's this sort of very limited range of feeling words. If we bring that back every time to the child's feelings, then the child is growing up thinking, my feelings are the most important thing. Of course, you love your children to bits, you die for them, but do you like them? Because that's really important in day-to-day -day living. But the other thing I say is that it's not only important that you like your own kids, but that other parents do and other people outside, because other, otherwise your kids are going to have a really hard time and you're not going to be doing them a right. favour if you bring them up to be unpopular with other kids' parents, because they're going to, they're going to depend on them. We know there's a large literature indicating that it's better for, par for children to have two parents. And I think the reason for that, this is my reasoning for it, there's a variety of reasons. Obviously, raising children and working is very difficult, so being able to split the labor is a way of perhaps not being entirely exhausted when you have small children. But I think there's something else going on too, which is more, it's, it's akin in some sense to the reason that there's sexual differentiation at a biological level. So there's sexual differentiation because it's useful to bring together two disparate creatures to produce a new variant. But I also think it's true on the personality front. So if you have a nicely organized marriage, you know, you're going to have your bits of insanity and your partner's going to have their bits of insanity. But if you can form a joint union, then I believe you can produce something approximating one sane person. And so, and that person is sane, that joint person is sane, not so much because they're sane psychologically, but because they're an analog of the broader social world. So, and I'm making, I'm saying that for a specific reason. So then the theory would be, if your children are acting in a way that both of you find displeasing, if you're honest, then the probability that other people will find that displeasing is extremely high because you at least love your children, whereas other people, you know, they might be willing to give them a chance, but they're not going to die for them. And so if you accept the additional hypothesis that the primary role of a parent is to prepare their children for, for what would you say, welcome acceptance into the broader social world, 
then you have a moral obligation to guide your children in some sense in accordance with your own joint feelings. If, if the two of you find your child's behavior unacceptable, you're morally obligated to let the child know because that is not going to translate well to other children, to other children's parents, to teachers, to any situations in public. And then your child's going to have a miserable time of it. And I, I think the research literature indicates that very clearly. Yeah, and I think, you know, you're right in the sense that the children need the male and the female, the masculine and the feminine, but that can be achieved in other ways. I've worked with all kinds of families, so I, my work is about um, make, creating the optimum situation for families, uh, no matter what the whether they're married or, or what kind of family situation they're in. So I would agree, and particularly that children need strong role models of the opposite sex and the same sex so you know if it's a single parent family for example to find those role models that are close family members because i you know or, or very good friends of the family that it has to be a close relationship i mean teachers as well but there are other adults who can fill that gap and and, and that is something right. that I think is very important that that gap is filled if the family isn't that uh, male-female unit of, of, of marriage that is the traditional unit. Right, because the children have to learn, okay, so there's two elements there. So you bring a mother and a father together and you the child gets the benefit of their joint personality, right? The fact that they've got two people to hit against and hopefully that makes one sane person. but. The socialization rules for being feminine and the socialization rules for being masculine aren't identical. And so that's part of the reason why it's necessary to have those contrary, contrasexual role models at hand. And at hand does mean something like making a relationship with, because the other thing we know about children is though they can establish multiple deep relationships with people so they can actually stand multiple caregivers but they don't really like a lot of change in their caregivers they don't like relationships once they're established to be to be decimated let's say well neither do adults but it's even more the case for children and so yeah it, it and it's harder for a single parent fam for someone who's running a single parent family to fill that well, fill that diversity of personality to solve that problem, but also to provide the contrasexual uh, role model. So, I, I agree. I mean, I think that consistency is really important for children, and it's fractured in so many ways now in society because if people move around more, people don't tend to stay in um, those units or those extended family groups in one area. So we have more and more, more and more challenges today in bringing up children and parents face well I, I'm, as you, I'm sure you're aware um, other challenges in terms of um, online life the internet um, influences from outside so yes that kind of, to try and create that consistency for children in their relationships in their close family relationships I think is one of the things that's very important um, having said that I mean it, you know, there are all sorts of situations that are not optimum for children. 